Hi everyone at home, we're live. Um, welcome to Cambridge University Astronomy and welcome to another public Wednesday evening of uh, science and stargazing. Um, very happy to say that we do have a science and stargazing evening. I've been told by our observers that conditions are perfect apparently. So we're expecting some nice views of Mars and some uh, nice faint nebula. Uh, before that, we've got our headline speaker. We've got jo uh, Dr. James Trussler, who is a postdoctoral researcher here in Cambridge, who works on um, many things, including the death of galaxies. And that's what he's going to be talking about today. He's going to be telling us why galaxies die. Um, so with that, over to you, James. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And Thank you everyone for tuning in. I wish you all a, a good evening. I hope that you're ready because tonight we're going to try to solve uh, a murder mystery of truly cosmic proportions. You see, a cosmic crime has been committed. Galaxies are dying left and right. And it's up to you and I to identify the key culprit. In order to do so, we will draw upon the power of the world's largest telescopes and cutting edge computer simulations as we try to solve this case and answer that key question, why do galaxies die? But like any good detective, we must first do our fair share of background research as we hunt for clues, following the trail of observational findings that led astronomers to ponder the very life and death of galaxies. If we turn back the hands of time 100 years in the past, astronomy was at a great crossroads. Astronomers peering through their telescopes had discovered a great number of fuzzy clouds with spiral arms. They called them spiral nebulae. And I show two of them here, a sketch from 1845 and a photograph from 1916. But the identity of these spiral nebulae and their literal place in the universe remained unknown. And so a great debate was raging and it had caused a great divide in the astronomical community. On the one hand, you had Harlow Shapley, and he believed that the spiral nebulae were located within the Milky Way. So much like the Orion Nebula that you may be familiar with. On the other hand, we had Heber Curtis, and he argued that the spiral nebulae were actually located outside the Milky Way. So much like the Andromeda Galaxy that we know that was at that time referred to as the Great Nebula and Andromeda. So who was right and who was wrong? Well, this profound question could only be answered by an accurate measure of the scale of the cosmos. And so this is where Edwin Hubble comes in, pictured here with the Andromeda galaxy in hand. He had at his disposal the Hooker telescope, 100 inches wide, and it was the world's largest telescope at the time. And using a new technique that measured the brightness of the stars within these nebulae, Hubble was able to determine the distance to them. Much like if I was pointing a torch in your direction and steadily went further backwards and backwards, the torch would appear fainter and fainter. So too do these stars appear fainter the further they are away from us. And using that approach, Hubble was able to determine the distance to these nebulae. And what he found was truly incredible. It completely transformed our understanding of the cosmos. Hubble found that these nebulae were in fact millions of light years away, so well beyond the confines of a Milky Way, which is only just a few thousands of light years across. And so what this meant was that spiral nebulae were like separate islands drifting in the grand sea of space. They called them island universes. And so the realm of extragalactic astronomy was born and Hubble, he studied these island universes or galaxies that we now call them in great numbers. By the dozens, by the hundreds he studied them. I mean, these are some of the pictures that he took. Hubble found that these galaxies exhibited a grand complexity. No two galaxies were alike. Each one was unique. But underlying this complexity also a simplicity at its heart, as Hubble found a clear pattern emerging in the galaxy population. I wonder, can you spot what that pattern might be? Perhaps if I shuffle the galaxies around a bit, it might be a bit clearer now. On the right hand side, we have galaxies that appear disc-like, they have spiral arms. And on the left-hand side, we have galaxies that appear more oval-like and more featureless. And so this is the identification that Hubble made a century ago. He referred to these galaxies as early types and late types. And so despite 
their complexity, galaxies actually have a true simplicity behind them. This kind of galaxy duality where you have these late types with their spiral arms and disc-like features and these early types with their oval-like shapes and generally featureless. And a century later, our understanding of the formation and evolution of galaxies has uh, advanced tremendously. So here's a picture of Messier 83. And we now know that galaxies are the cosmic cities within which stars are born. So galaxies are composed of stars, both the bright blue stars lacing the spiral arms, but also the cooler orange stars in the heart of this galaxy. Galaxies are also composed of hydrogen gas and it's spotted around the galaxy here, glowing that characteristic red, the hydrogen gas glows as it's heated and energized by the light from these hot young stars. But these galaxies are also filled, speckled around with dust. These are the grains of carbon, the grains of silicon that block the starlight, giving the galaxy a characteristic brown color in those dust lanes. And so this tremendous advancement in our knowledge and understanding of galaxies has come about largely due to great advances in our ability to simulate our galaxy formation and evolution. And I'd like to share with you one such simulation. It's the Eagle simulation, and it traces the formation and evolution of galaxies from the Big Bang all the way to the present. And so what is shown here is the hydrogen gas, the fundamental building block that fills our universe. And under the inward pull of gravity, this hydrogen gas assembles, it accumulates into these filaments, much like a spider web is the pattern that is formed. And we refer to this pattern as the cosmic web. And under the inward pull of gravity, these great rivers of hydrogen flow, they stream, they all converge on the center of your screen, all onto one point, a single point, that's the galaxy being formed right in the center. And as it's being continuously fed fresh hydrogen gas along these rivers of hydrogen, this galaxy grows, it begins to assemble. This hydrogen gas provides the fuel with which the galaxy can form stars, out of which it can grow and continue to assemble new material. But this galaxy is not just by itself. As you'll now see, what's going to happen is one galaxy is going to merge with another. And it's just this interplay between one galaxy and the next, that dynamic that plays a very important role in the formation and evolution of galaxies. And so we've been focusing on one galaxy here, but if we zoom out, we find that our universe is filled with them. Not just hundreds, not just thousands, but as we'll see, many, many billions of galaxies exist within our universe. And that is what I'd like to talk about today, the formation and evolution of galaxies, their life and their death. So we've also had tremendous advancements observationally. So here is a picture of the very large telescope located in Chile. And it's aptly named, it's eight meters wide, so it's 10 times the collecting area of the Hooker uh, telescope that Hubble used a century ago. And with this vast increase in collecting area, these telescopes of the modern day are able to pick out the faintest glimmers of light in the universe, ranging from hidden dwarf galaxies in our cosmic back garden in the vicinity of our Milky Way galaxy, all the way out to witness the rise of the very first galaxies in the universe, just a fraction after the Big Bang, several hundred million years. But not only that, we don't just have telescopes on the ground, we also have telescopes now in space. And perhaps the most iconic of all I show here is the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's revolutionized our understanding of the cosmos. Although Edwin Hubble is no longer with us, his observational pursuit of the heavens continues to live on with the Hubble Space Telescope. And over its 30 years of existence, it's truly transformed our understanding of the evolution of galaxies. And it's produced so many wonderful pictures. And I'm sure we each have our own favorite Hubble Space Telescope pictures, but I'd like to share with you today my favorite one. It's this one, it's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's a stunning cosmic vista filled with galaxies, all adrift in the grand sea of space. It's what you get if you point the Hubble Space Telescope for 10 whole days in an empty patch of sky. No galaxies, no stars, and this is what you find. A stunning image filled with galaxies. But this was just encompassing a very small part of the night sky. If you take the size of the full moon and you just have one tenth of that, that's really what we're looking for here with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And so many galaxies to behold, but even more 
if you zoom in. And so there's 10,000 galaxies in the Hubble ultra deep field, field alone. And if you scale this image up to the full extent of the night sky, then you find that that means that there's hundreds of billions of galaxies in our universe. And in Hubble's lifetime, he was only able to study several hundred galaxies a hundred years ago. But now we have large galaxy surveys probing millions of galaxies and soon to be billions of galaxies. And so through this great advancement in technology, our way to view the universe has fundamentally changed. And so if we take this old view, this century old view of Hubble, we can see it in a completely new light. So imagine closing your eyes and reopening them and seeing the universe in a completely new way. Well, there's no need to imagine. Let me show you what that would look like. So this is how we perceive galaxies today. It's completely enormous advancement to what we had 100 years ago. This is 100 years in the making, a century's worth of technological advancement. And what we see that's very striking is that these late type galaxies with their spiral arms tend to have blue colors. Whereas these early type galaxies that are more over-like and featureless, they tend to have orangey red colors. And so if we take this view of galaxy duality put forth by Hubble a century ago, well, we can greatly expand upon that now. This is our, our modern view of galaxy duality. Yes, we have our late types and we have our early types, but they're just like shapes and they're over-like shapes, but they also have their colors. So blue versus red. And what we know about these galaxy colors is they reflect the colors of the stars residing in these galaxies. It turns out that blue stars are very, very young, whereas these red, orange red stars are very, very old. And so this in turn means that these late type galaxies are young and these early type galaxies are old. And the very reason why we have this difference in galaxy age is because these late type galaxies, they have their spiral arms, they're continually forming new stars that you can see a characteristic blue glow, whereas these early types, they're not forming any stars at all. And so it's not so much about late types and early types. No, our modern view is all about those galaxies that form stars and those galaxies that do not. We call them star forming galaxies and passive galaxies, truly the living and the dead. And so that brings us to that key question. Why do galaxies die? That is why do galaxies stop forming stars? Well, to understand that, we have to understand why galaxies do form stars in the first place. And so what it comes down to is you have your giant cloud of hydrogen gas, light years across. And I show a particular uh, very well-known image is the Pillars of Creation. It's one example of such a hydrogen cloud. And what, you what you need to form stars is to have this hydrogen cloud collapse to form something the size of our sun, which is billions of times smaller. And so how do you get from something that is light years across to something the size of our sun, a million kilometers wide? Well, there's one particular physical process that's very good at bringing things together, and that's gravity. So provided that gravity can act, then stars will form out of this cold hydrogen gas. And so if we then ask the question, why do galaxies die? Why do they stop forming stars? Well, it must be then, if you have that cold gas, that it's no longer there, that there's processes acting within these galaxies that remove that gas, that it's not there, or that heat, that gas, so that it's no longer cold. It can no longer collapse to form new stars. And so there's actually a, a grand list of potential culprits that could be causing galaxies to die. And I'd like to line them all, all up for you now. So our first culprit are supernovae. These are exploding stars. As stars reach the end of their lives, they do so in a very spectacular fashion. They undergo this enormous cosmic explosion. And to show just how spectacular these ex cosmic explosions can be, I'd like to draw your attention to the picture at the bottom. This is a picture of Messier 82. It's a, it's a galaxy uh, that's not too distant from us. It's in the constellation Ursa Major, and it's actually a prime target for observing evenings here at the Institute of Astronomy. So hopefully when things get back to normal, you'll have a chance to see it through the telescopes that, that, that we have here. And so on the left, we show this galaxy before some particular event that happened on January the 22nd, 2014. And on the right, we show the galaxy afterwards. And what we find all of a sudden, this is very new bright source of light that wasn't there before. Now this is a single supernova, a single exploding star, and it shines with the brightness of 10 billion suns. 
And so these supernovae, these exploding stars, they release an enormous amount of energy. And this energy is capable of heating and ejecting the hydrogen gas that exists within the galaxy. And to give you an example of how spectacular that can be, I draw your attention to that image of the Crab Nebula Messier 1. The star in that nebula exploded 1,000 years ago. You can see the dramatic effect that that has had on the gas surrounding it. But to understand what these supernovae do on a galaxy-wide scale, I show you this picture of Messier 82. So you can see the young stars in the disk shining that characteristic blue light and also that brown dust that fills the galaxy as well. But if you look above and below the disk of the galaxy, you see this glowing red hydrogen gas again. Now it's been ejected, it's been kicked out of the galaxy by the energy released by these supernovae explosions. And because of that very energy, this hydrogen gas is also glowing that characteristic red as it's been energized by these supernovae explosions. And so what these supernovae do is they kick out hydrogen gas out of the galaxy. And this gas is what's needed to form stars. And so by this process, you can actually lead to shutting down a star formation in galaxies, causing galaxies to die. Now for our second culprit, this one has forever captured the hearts and minds of people across the world, but especially so in recent times because they've been the subject of the 2020 Nobel Prize in physics. Now black holes are so well known because their gravity is so strong that not even light can escape their grasp. So we can't ever hope to see a black hole directly, but we can actually infer their presence indirectly by the gravitational pull that they exert on the gas and stars around them. That is the technique that was uh, used in this Nobel Prize work. So what I'm gonna show you is an animation that shows the, the orbits of the stars in the center of a Milky Way galaxy. And so if we just have a look at that, what we'll see, if we track these stars for a grand total of 25 years, you'll see that they move around on the plane of the sky. And that, that, that star with the yellow uh, line actually just went through this very quick change in direction, almost like it's orbiting around something. So much like our Earth orbits around the sun and the moon orbits around the Earth, so too are these stars orbiting around something in the center of uh, this, th this video. But that object remains unseen. We cannot see any light coming off of it. And if you understand the laws of physics, you can actually understand the motion of the stars about this object. And you can calculate what is the mass of the object causing this orbital motion. And if you do that, you find that this object actually has 4 million times the mass of the sun. So we truly have this enormous behemoth lurking in the center of our Milky Way galaxy, but we cannot see it. And so we have strong reason to believe that this is in fact a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. Now we're quite fortunate because this supermassive black hole is relatively dormant. It's not really active. It's not constantly consuming hydrogen gas. But in other galaxies, they're not quite so lucky. Their supermassive black holes are feeding on gas, and this can have a very dramatic effect. And to understand why, because the gravity of these supermassive black holes is so strong, this gas, this hydrogen gas, gets accelerated to very, very, very high speeds. And as this gas brushes against each other in this, this hot disk, it actually gets heated up to enormous temperatures, so millions of degrees Celsius, hundreds of times the temperature the surface of our sun. And so this gas actually glows very, very, very brightly um, indeed. And to understand how brightly this gas glows, take a look at this picture. It's a 3C273. Now this is no star. This is in fact a galaxy. But the reason why it looks like a star is because a supermassive black hole is shining so, so brightly. The gas around it is shining so brightly that it outshines the entire galaxy itself. So it looks like a single point on the sky, much like a star, but this is no star, this is an entire galaxy. And so these supermassive black holes can release an enormous amount of energy in this way, and that's capable of heating and ejecting the hydrogen gas from these galaxies, the fuel needed to form stars. And this can lead to the death of galaxies as well, just like the supernovae explosions I mentioned earlier. So far, we've been looking at objects that are internal to galaxies that reside within them. So the exploding stars, the supernovae and the supermassive black holes. So really the role of nature in the life and death of galaxies. But what about the role of nurture, the role of the cosmic environment within which galaxies reside? Well, here I show you a picture of a bell 2,744. It's an enormous 
galaxy cluster located 3 billion light years away. And what you see here are hundreds upon hundreds of galaxies all clustered together in a relatively small space, 10 million light years across. And in this picture alone, what you're seeing is a quadrillion times the mass of the sun. So a million billion times the mass of the sun. This makes these galaxy clusters the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. But what you're seeing here with your eyes and the visible light that we can see is just the tip of the iceberg. We're just scratching the surface. If you could augment your vision to see in the x-rays, this is what you would see. This bright blue glow pervading through the galaxy cluster, filling the space between the galaxies. And so if you're a galaxy moving through this cluster, you're brushing past that gas, that actually has a very, very important effect on these galaxies evolution. And to understand that, well, let's put ourselves in the perspective of this galaxy moving through this galaxy cluster. I wonder what that would feel like. Well, it'd be much like if you jumped out of a plane and went skydiving, but in fact, it'd be many, many times worse than that because these galaxies are falling at hundreds of kilometers per second and they're brushing past gas that is tens of millions of degrees hot, so a thousand times the surface of the sun. And so this has a dramatic effect on the evolution of these galaxies. As you could imagine, they might not be able to maintain this tight configuration that these skydivers have. They begin to disintegrate. And so here I show you uh, an animation of that actually taking place. This is a galaxy moving through a galaxy cluster and you will see that its, ga its gas gets stripped as it moves through the galaxy cluster. It moves from left to right and on the left hand side, the trailing side, you see these long tendrils, these jellyfish like tendrils of hydrogen gas being left behind as it moves through this galaxy cluster. Now, if we actually look at the universe itself, we do in fact see this. This is a picture of a galaxy moving through a galaxy cluster. And you can see this trail of hydrogen gas that's being left in its wake, that blue glow of light. And so this is gas that has been stripped from this galaxy as it's moving through the cluster. And so galaxy clusters also play an important role in the life and death of galaxies because they can remove that gas, that, that, that fuel needed for star formation. So we have, are suspects. They've all been lined up, the supernovae, the supermassive black holes and the galaxy clusters. Now it's time to identify the true culprit. To do that, we have to gather evidence. And our tool for the task is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's been in operation since 1998 and it's this 2.5 meter telescope in New Mexico and USA. And over these long years of uh, operations and observing the night sky, it's been able to surf, survey 35% of the night sky and it's delivered enormous insights on the life and death on galaxies. And to understand why the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has been so revolutionary, I'd like to show you this image of the Virgo galaxy cluster. It's actually the closest galaxy cluster to our Milky Way galaxy. Now the beauty of taking images is that it allows you to readily see galaxy shapes and galaxy sizes, but it also provides you a very efficient way to study many galaxies at the same time. But if you want to understand more about galaxies, you have to take that light and break it down into its rainbow of light. You need to take the galaxy spectrum. That tells you even more information. But traditionally, this has been a very inefficient process because you point your telescope at one galaxy, you take its spectrum, its rainbow of light, and then you move on to the next galaxy and you repeat that process again and again, one by one. So it's not a very efficient way to do that. Well, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has found a much more efficient way to do this. This is what it looks like when taking the Sloan Digital Sky Surveys approach. You can actually gather the light from all of these galaxies on the night sky at the same time. And so the way that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has done this is they have a particular plate for each set of observations to be made. Each hole in that plate corresponds to a single galaxy on the night sky. And so if you're interested in looking at this plate, uh, I recommend you to go to the Kavli Institute here in Cambridge um, where they actually have a plate hanging from the walls and you can look at it in more detail. So taking this approach, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has been able to take spectra from over 600 galaxies at once. And so it's been able to obtain galaxy spectra for over 1 million galaxies. This is enormous statistics. And this is all for galaxies that are in the so-called local universe. So only 1 billion light years away, relatively speaking, our cosmic back garden. And so with this enormous statistics, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has fundamentally transformed our understanding 
of the life and death of galaxies because it's enabled astronomers to take a galaxy census. And this has enabled us to understand the roles of nature and nurture in the life and death of galaxies. And now to understand how this can be done, imagine if you wanted to understand the effect that a particular disease had on the human population. Well, you might be interested to know how it affects people of different ages, so people that are young or people that are old, maybe people with different weights, so people that are underweight or people that are overweight. Really, the, how people's inherent properties, their traits, their nature affects the impact of that disease. But you might also be interested in understanding how people's geographical location matters, so whether people reside in the city center or they're living out in the countryside, or perhaps if one is living in the hot tropics or out at the Arctic. So really the role of the environment, the role of nurture. Well, we can do much the same with galaxies. We can look at the relative number of star forming and passive galaxies, the living and the dead, and see how that depends on how big galaxies are, whether they're small or whether they're large. So the role of nature. But we can also look at galaxies' geographical location, so the cosmic environment within which they reside, so whether galaxies are isolated or whether they reside in these big galaxy clusters that I looked at before. And if you do that, this is what you find. You find that small isolated galaxies, almost all of them are actively forming stars. There's hardly any of these passive dead galaxies for small isolated systems. But if you look at larger galaxies, bigger ones, you actually find a completely different picture a lot more of those galaxies are actually dead. They're no longer forming stars. So clearly, nature plays a really important role. How big galaxies are is very important in their life and their death. But you can also look at the role of environments, the role of nurture. So if you look at galaxies in big clusters, you find again that a lot of them are actually dead. They're no longer forming stars. And if you look at dead large galaxies, uh, if you look at large galaxies and big galaxy clusters, you find actually that almost all of these are passive, they're not forming stars. So what does this mean in terms of the key suspects we had before? Well, much like Agatha's Christie's um, Murder on the Orient Express, we find that each of these key suspects has played a crucial role in the life and death of galaxies. So if we look at small galaxies, their gravity is so weak that these uh, cosmic explosions, these supernova really play an important role in the death of small galaxies. On the other hand, if we look at really big galaxies, these have enormous supermassive black holes, so billions of times the mass of the sun. And these are very effective at killing big galaxies. And we've already seen the effect that galaxy clusters have on the life and death of galaxies. They strip that gas away, leading to galaxy death. So really all of our key suspects, supernovae, supermassive black holes and galaxy clusters, they play their part in galaxy life and death. Well then, that's the, the case closed then. The murder mystery has been solved, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. There's actually many, many interesting things to still understand in the future. And when it comes to envisioning what the future entails, I like to draw upon the knowledge and the experience of those older and wiser than myself. So I found this quote that I thought was particularly fitting. To look to the future, we must first look back upon the past. That is where the seeds of the future were planted. And this quote was actually given by someone I think we'd all regard as very wise indeed. It was Albert Einstein actually who said this. And I think this quote is very fitting, not just for life in general, but particularly for scientific research. As we can learn so much from our past as we try to pave our way towards the future. So imagine if you were a classicist, you were studying the ancients, the Greeks and the Romans, we have learned so much about uh, their, their ways by studying the relics that have survived through the ages, like the Acropolis here in Athens, or the ancient literary works that we still have access to even 2000 years into the future. But imagine how amazing it would be if we could truly just go back in time to see these people as they were thousands of years ago in the past, to see how they lived their lives and that ancient knowledge that has been lost through the passage of time. Or imagine if you were a paleontologist, you were studying dinosaurs. We have come to learn so much about the life and death of dinosaurs by studying their fossils that have survived through millions upon millions of years. But how incredible it would be if you could go back in time to witness the rise and fall of dinosaurs with your own eyes. That would be so 
uh, incredible. That would make such an enormous difference to our knowledge and understanding. Well, when it comes to astronomy, we can in fact do just that. We do have a window with which to view the past. And that window is the universe itself. You see, space is so vast that not even light can instantly traverse it. So what that means is that the further we go into the distance, the further we go into the past, because it takes longer for that light to reach us. And so in doing so, we can actually witness these galaxies exactly as they were billions of years ago in the past. So, so far, we've tried to understand the life and death of galaxies by studying galaxies in our cosmic back garden in the present day universe. But these galaxies died aeons ago. We've arrived at the crime scene billions of years too late. If we truly want to understand why galaxies die, then we have to witness the crime as it's being committed billions of years ago in the past. And that is why for this research, the future lies in the past. So we have come to learn a lot about the life and death of galaxies. But if we truly want to know, if we truly want to understand, then we have to go back. We have to go back to the past because it's only then that we can truly answer that key question and that question is, why do galaxies die? I'd like to thank you all for your attention today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. I'm glad to receive them. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much, James. That is uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, there's been a couple of questions come through and uh, while James answers these ones, um, if anyone's got questions at home, if you pop them in the YouTube chat, I will make sure uh, James gets to them. Uh, so first of all, I've got a question about dark matter. Um, so someone wants to know, why do we say that uh, the movement of uh, the rotation speeds of galaxies is due to dark matter? Um, you know, could it be that we just, uh, we've just made a mistake somewhere? So this is an excellent question. So when it comes to understanding the motions of the gas and stars around galaxies, we actually have a, a great a way to, to analyze that. So we can measure the velocities of the gas, the speeds of the gas and the stars, and we know our laws of motion, our Newton's laws of motion. And so if we compare how much mass there is, how much matter there is that we can actually see through our telescopes and compare that to how much is needed to produce the motions of the gas and stars around these galaxies, we find that in fact, there's far too little to explain uh, that. And so really we do think that dark matter and matter that we cannot see is there. It's really the glue that's binding these galaxies together. But this doesn't just apply on a galaxy wide scale. If you actually look at the galaxy clusters that I showed earlier, you can actually do much the same thing. You can look at how much light is being given off and how much visible matter, how many stars and gas should be there to provide that. But if you actually look at the motions of galaxies in these galaxy clusters, and indeed the bending of light as it passes through these galaxy clusters, you find that there's not enough mass to explain that. So we really do think that dark matter is important, uh, both for the evolution of galaxies, but also galaxy clusters as well. Cool, thanks, James. Uh, lots of people saying uh, thank you, very interesting. Uh, there's a question from Alfie who wants to know, can one black hole crash into another black hole? So actually, yes, black hole mergers are a thing. And it's something that we really want to start investigating now uh, with the advent of gravitational wave astronomy. See, we've been peering at the universe uh, historically through the visible, so the light that you and I can see. But telescopes are now being able to go beyond that. So going to the uh, infrared, the ultraviolet, the X-ray, but that's all in the electromagnetic spectrum, so light, itself, but we're beginning to be able to probe a different kind of wave, not a light wave, but gravitational waves. And actually, when two black holes merge, they produce this gravitational wave signature. And we've been able to actually get signatures of that black hole, black hole mergers. It's been an enormous discovery that was made five years ago. So certainly, we've been able to witness that. And we've been able to actually do follow-up studies of the galaxies that had these black hole, black hole merge. And they've given us so much information about galaxy evolution. Um, wonderful, thank you. Yes, the gravitational waves are, are, are pretty exciting. 
Uh, another question uh, about neutron stars this time. Um, so once a big star has died and left behind a neutron star, what happens next? What's next in the life of, uh, for a neutron star? Well, so I think that the life in, uh, of a neutron star really depends on um, the environment within which it resides. So we talked about nature and nurture before, and I think that's actually really applicable for neutron stars as well, because if a neutron star is all by itself, it's isolated, it has nothing near to another star, for example, then really it's just going to continue in that state for a very, very long time. Now, these neutron stars are giving off light, and if you wait long and long enough, it will cool down and it will leave behind, um, I think, a, a, a very cool star, so a black dwarf, actually. But if you had a neutron star that's uh, got a companion, so you have two stars in the same system. So our solar system has just a single star, the sun, but we've had other systems of stars that have multiple stars. That neutron star actually has a quite strong gravity and it can pull on the gas uh, surrounding its companion star. And that can actually fall onto the neutron star itself. And that can actually lead to powerful uh, emission of X-rays among other things. Great. Well, thank you very much, James. Uh, the audience at home uh, seem very appreciative. Uh, and yeah, so that was very, very fascinating. Thank you. Um, and we're going to switch now, as long as the skies are still uh, clear, fingers crossed, we're going to switch now to uh, the amateur astronomers, the CAA, who um, are hopefully uh, have some telescopes trained at some interesting targets. OK, thank you very much. And we're first off, we're going to visit uh, Paul's observatory in over and see what he's got us lined up for us yes absolutely brian can you hear me yes we can hear you right i'm just going to uh, get the camera going I'm, okay i couldn't find the object that you gave me to no I, I i understand but what happened is uh, i gave paul um an object to find it was called the tulip nebula it looks like a tulip obviously and it's in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. But it's fairly low down in the sky. And it's a hydrogen gas cloud, which is red. And the eye just isn't very sensitive to red light. So he struggled to find it, but had to give up in the end. So moving further down the uh, Swan's neck, he's found the Crescent Nebula which is another uh, gas cloud. This time, it's a giant cosmic bubble, about 25 light years across. And it's being blown out by a central star, which is absolutely massive. You can see it in the center. Have you got a cursor, Paul? Can you point to the, uh, the star? That's it, thank you. And this is known as a wolf rayet star, and it's come to the end of its life and is shedding material. And it sheds about a, a solar mass every 10,000 years. And this wind, this stellar wind, is driving away this uh, bubble. And it's, it, the star has now lost most of its outer layers of hydrogen and is now currently fusing helium into heavier elements. So it's on its way to becoming a supernova. These are the death throes of this star. And uh, it's got a very complex structure. Uh, the, 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 the interstellar winds uh, uh, are interacting with the material uh, that it shed from an earlier phase. And it's burning its fuel at a prodigious rate and it will go supernova, but not, not, not soon, in, in, a, in a few hundred thousand years time. So that, that's where we'll see it. Right, it's about 6,000 light years away. And uh, the other nebula I was going to look at, or we hope to look at, the Tulip Nebula, uh, I, I chose it because it was right beside a, another star that had a black hole orbiting around it. That was the only reason I chose it. But we'll, 
we're, we're well, quite I, happy with this. Yeah, Brian. So this is a one minute long exposure. Right. Showing you how faint this is with the 14 inch telescope. And I've got the hydrogen alpha filter in the camera. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seeing it at all due to no. the light pollution. But this cuts through the light pollution. So what I might do when we finished with this and you, you're being entertained by one of the others is I might go back and try again uh, to see if I can locate the uh, Tulip Nebula for you. Uh, uh, don't worry, you, you can carry on with the, uh, with the other one, if you like, the Fireworks Galaxy, if you okay. would. That, that will be fine. Because uh, it, is, it is very difficult, uh, whereas this was discovered visually, whereas the Tulip Nebulae nebula was uh, only found photographically so it it was a, a mission impossible i say you apologies so we'll come back to you in a bit okay if we could go over to uh, mick in swaffham prior and we'll see what he's got for us good evening brian i'm going to share screen Oh, it's gone. Oh, oh there, there we go. No problem finding this. And we can all see it's Mars. And just, there we go. I've used a, a times two um, Barlow, but it's still quite small. It seems to be getting smaller each week now. Yeah. So, and this is, uh, we can see some markings on it but it's very, very faint. Yeah, it's the sharpest I can get it at the moment. No, that's okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to try a little experiment. We're going to uh, take a, a capture a, some video of this, and then we'll, make, we'll process it while we're away. Uh, do you want to do it now? Okay, I'm... As you can see, it's now recording at 39 frames per second. I'm going to do a thousand frames and then I'll process it for when you come back next time. And then we'll be able to see uh, what Mick's been impact. able to do, do with the image. We can see some, as I say, a few markings, but it's not very clear. And the atmosphere is playing havoc. It's, it's not a very clear night. It's not very uh, still and steady. You can see the atmosphere is wobbling the image of Mars all about. Right, have you captured it? Yes, all captured. Right, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. And what he'll do, that there's probably over a thousand frames he's captured, and he'll use about 30% of them and merge them into a picture. So when we come back, We'll see what you've produced. Okay. Yes. And now we're going over to David. In uh, Halton. How are you doing? Hal <laughs> Halton is uh, not very far away from the radio telescopes in Indeed. Barton. So mm -hmm. uh, how's you? We, we had some cloud earlier, but I hope you're all uh, clear and ready to go. Yes, um, I'll share my screen. set me a couple of challenging objects tonight. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> but you've done it. Well done. You. Uh, yeah. This time we managed to get two objects on one screen. Over on the right, we can see a star that has died. This was one object we went to look at, meant to look at uh, when we were covering William Herschel's uh, discoveries. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at a lo lot of objects uh, that William Herschel discovered. And uh, he, he discovered uh, uh, this one in about 1780s, in the 1780s. And he called it a planetary nebula, which is totally misleading. It's nothing to do with planets. It's just that uh, these are generally round like planets. But what they are is stars under eight solar masses, when they come to the end of their life, they don't 
die in a spectacular supernova explosion. They gently puff off their outer layers of uh, the star, and these form these planetary nebulae, which are generally round. And then all that's left of the star is a very hot white dwarf. And these can be, these are some of the hottest stars we see. And they're just the ember, if you like, of the, the star. And although they're very hot, the fusing process has finished and they're starting to cool down. And they'll spend the rest of eternity, if you like, cooling down. Now, this, uh, this planetary nebulae is quite a complex one. It's, uh, it's thrown off multiple shells of gas. We can't see it here. We need a much bigger telescope at the top of a, a, a mountain top where the air is much thinner and clearer to see the detail in this, uh, in this planetary nebulae. But the shells of gas are arranged like Russian dolls. And that's uh, sort of uh, the last gasps of this dying star. Although the structure isn't fully understood, but it's, it, we know it's fairly complex. And over on the right hand side is a, a bit of a, the centre of a galaxy. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that the Milky Way was uh, found to be a barred spiral. And this we can see here is a, a distant galaxy that uh, we could just see the, the, we could see some structure. Actually, when you move the galaxy, we could see the spiral arms. Yes, we can see a ring of spiral arms, but there's a bar going right across it. And this is a nice example of a barred spiral galaxy like our own. Uh, astronomers way back in the 1960s suspected that the Milky Way did have a bar in it, but it wasn't proven until the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope looked at it looked at our, the centre of our galaxy in 2005. And it, and it turned out that the bar is much, much bigger in our, in our galaxy than we first thought. But this, this galaxy is the most distant object we'll see tonight. Uh, we'll look at some closer galaxy. Uh, uh, this is about 350 million light years away. So the light set, set off before it reached David's telescope in the Carboniferous period, when uh, there were just amphibians clumping around on Earth and uh, the, the, there were the coal forests still growing in those days. So that, that the light has taken all that time to travel across to reach, to reach us. So that's why it's, it's quite faint. How long our exposure are you using on this one? Um, check. This is 30 seconds. Yeah, so again, it's a, a, a difficult object. I promise I will. I have given you easier objects <laughs> <laughs> for next week. This is a magnitude 15. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's quite faint. Yeah. So... So, right. Um, Brian, I have another camera looking at it. Um, yeah. Um, let's see what that made of it. Oh, is this the... the this is the, the colour camera. Right, this is the cat's so eye. Here's our uh, planetary nebula. Yeah, it's called the cat's eye nebula. Uh, there's, there's the uh, barred spiral. And so okay. we can see some of the structure, yeah. but certainly we can see the bar. Most, but quite a bit of uh, most galaxies are just uh, uh, spirals. They don't have a bar, but uh, that's that's okay. Could you go back to the uh, uh, cat's eye nebula? See if that uh, comes up any better. See if we can see any structure. We can't, 
we can't see any uh, uh, any of. Oh yes, we can. Yeah, as you, as you went through, I could see some concentric rings. Uh, that that's what it's like. It's it's like a, a detail uh, picture from a huge telescope shows it very similar to uh, uh, like a spirograph gone mad with lots of rings around it. So. Yep. Yep. Okie doke. Right. We'll we'll come back to you, and you'll you'll be finding the uh, A E Ariga, right, and the Flaming Star Nebula. We'll give you a bit of time. Hopefully, Paul is ready now with an easier object. Are you there, Paul? I believe I've got it. Yeah. Um, Good. Let me just share my screen for you. Can you see that okay? Yeah, this is, we've got a spiral galaxy. I think I've and, got both the objects you wanted in yeah, one shot here. Yeah, a, a, a spiral galaxy and an open cluster. Uh, the fireworks galaxy is a, a face-on spiral galaxy. You can see the spiral structure that Paul's uh, indicating. It's it's uh, it's nicely seen there, but this is called the fireworks galaxy because over a hundred year period from 1917 to 2017, there were ten supernovae in this uh, galaxy. Hence, it got its name, and. Uh, this is despite it being uh, about uh, one third the size of the Milky Way and only contains half the number of stars of the Milky Way. And you, we, uh, the Milky Way only has one supernova every, at an average rate of one every hundred years, but this has 10 uh, being a smaller galaxy. So it certainly deserves its name. And incidentally, this was, of course, discovered by William Herschel. But because it's quite close to the centre of our galaxy, we're looking through a lot of dust and gas. So this galaxy is quite faint. If it was uh, uh, away from the plane of the galaxy, it would be quite a bright object and uh, easily visible. And uh, as well as lots of supernovae going off in this galaxy, it's also got a lot of star formation going on. And so much so, it's been class classified as an active starburst galaxy. So lots of gas being turned into young blue stars. And you can see it's got quite a compact nucleus. And then just moving a little way away, we can see a star cluster. And I bet you can't guess who discovered this. Yep, it's our friend William. He, he discovered it, obviously, on the same night he discovered the, uh, uh, the fireworks galaxy. But this is about 80 stars, but it's a, a, an amazingly old cluster. Star clusters generally form, they condense down from... Uh, gas clouds and form into stars and then over a period of dozens and hundreds and sometimes thousands of years the stars disperse into the interstellar medium the uh, the star cluster breaks up but this star cluster is over a billion years old and one wonders it, it must be very well uh, it's the stars just haven't separated and flown away. Uh, it's being held by gravity, and it's unusual for a star cluster to last this long. And uh, it's uh, it's about four thousand light years away. Compare it to the uh, fireworks galaxy, which is twenty five million light years away. So you've got a vast difference in scales here. 
uh, the Farwark galaxy is one of the closest galaxies that's not in our local group. We're in a, a local group of about 30 galaxies. And this is just uh, 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 one of the closest outside. So, so we can see if we look at the glob, uh, the open cluster, these, these, these are inside our Milky Way, whereas the galaxy is obviously, as we heard from a speaker, outside the Milky Way. But we could see that the, the, some of these stars actually appear orange. I don't know if you could see on your screen, Paul, the more the orange ones that have turned into red giants. This cluster is so old that the stars have gone through their nuclear fuel uh, and started to swell up into red giants. And we could see uh, a number of these uh, red giants, uh, especially towards the bottom of the cluster of stars. There's quite a, as a, a sort of almost a rectangle of bright orange stars at the bottom there. Yes, Brian, when I look really closely at the uh, image, uh, my eyes right up to the screen, you really can see the colour. Yeah, there and then some above it and some to the right. Yeah. So this is this is the they've because the, the stars normally disperse well before they've used uh, the, their, their hydrogen up, fusing hydrogen into helium. But as I say, this cluster has stayed together for an enormous amount of time. And in the uh, following weeks, we'll look at other star clusters which are breaking up and dispersing. So that's our, our two objects in one go. So that's, uh, that was well done, Paul. Are you using a filter? Because uh, uh, David yes, I, was. I, Initially, I couldn't see it at all when I had the hydrogen alpha filter in there. Uh, so I took that out and put the uh, city light suppression filter in instead to kill some of the light pollution and cut through it. But it's worked. And it's we're, starting to, we're, we're starting to see the uh, galaxy a little bit clearer. So I think it must have been a bit mistier earlier on. And it's yeah, clearing. I've been fiddling with the controls a little bit to try and uh, change the gain and the exposure time. Yeah, but that, that's a cracking shot. So two objects found by our friend William Herschel. Okay, we're now going to go back to Mick and see how he's got on with his uh, clip of video and see what he's produced. Right, Brian. Um... Um, that's the image from the uh, original one. Did you want to see? The... We want it on screen. Yeah, we have got it on screen. It? It's on screen, is it? No, it's not on the screen. You've only got it on your desktop so at the moment. Oh, well, that's strange. Um. Share the screen again. Yeah, try again. There you go. Is that on? Yes. Uh, now we can see that the uh, process has captured uh, and cleared up the wobbliness of the atmosphere, the blurring effects of the atmosphere. And we can start to see uh, a, a marking on the, on the planet. And this area here, I've, I've got a feeling it's upside down. Looking at if you could, if turn it over, that will keep me happy. That's it. Is that better? Yeah. Now, is it? Bring it up. There you go. Yeah. And that that's uh, that's an area uh, known as. Uh, Terra, 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 I'll get it right in a minute. 
It's te Terra Samaria. And it's uh, a highland area uh, covered by uh, impact craters, craters and uh, there's lots of gullies there and uh, valleys carved by water. So this is a very ancient terrain, this dark area. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's to the left at nine o'clock, you can see a lighter patch right on the, on that, on the limb. If you go up, there we are. That bit there is the uh, Amazonia region. Uh, that is comparatively young. It's only a uh, hundred million years old, whereas the the uh, the darker area is billions of years old. It's over over three and a half billion years old, whereas this light area on the on the uh, nine o'clock is a a very much lighter area, and it's. Uh, it's so young, it has very few craters on it, and it's very smooth. And it's, it's like a, a volcanic, dusty uh, desert region. And it's one of the areas where the uh, Martian dust devils occur. I'm sure you've all seen films of dust devils on Earth. They're just a few meters across uh, these sort of mini tornadoes, these spinning columns of air. But on Mars, they're much, much bigger. They're 50 times the size of the width and could be up to eight kilometers high. So these dust devils on Mars are truly enormous. And on the, in this particular region, the Amazonia region, they occur usually in the afternoon uh, throughout the spring and summer of Mars, Mars, and uh, they were they they did come in handy uh, way back with a few years ago with uh, the two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. They were solar powered rovers, and there's a lot of wind borne dust on Mars, which kept covering their solar panels and uh, impairing their efficiency. So the, the these dust devils would come along and give the solar panels a quick clean as they whipped past, they would blow off the wind, the dust off these solar panels. And it, 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 it kept the uh, rovers going for longer than they would have if they had just been allowed to have their solar panels clog up with dust. So the uh, dust devils were helpful. Okay, I think that's a, a cracking view and certainly shows how computer enhancement can uh, improve an image. So yeah, that's good. Right, we should go back to David and and we should see what he's got. Are you there, David? You're on mute, David. Ah, here we are. You must forgive me. I've just had one of those dreadful moments when Microsoft decide that this is a really good time to update your computer. <laughs> yeah, we, don't and worry. Don't worry. Uh, I've, I've got the telescope looking at AE Origa. Yeah. And, and all of my applications crashed. So I'm just rebooting one of them and hopefully we will see something. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Just, I was just going to say, tell, tell us a bit about your observatory while we wait. We've got a few minutes before we have to end. So uh, just, just, talk us through your equipment while it updates <laughs> so you can <laughs> I love putting you on a spot absolutely um, uh, is it a 14 moved, inch uh, I've got a 8 inch Richie Kretchen yeah um, which is here we go 
let me just connect my. So if it's pro causing you a problem, we'll we'll pull, <laughs> we'll go I, back to Paul and give Paul a hard time if you yeah, like. Um, okay, well, we shall we come that. back to you? Yeah. Okay, just give, Paul. Just give me a few minutes here. Yeah, we'll do. I'll. Um... Right. Hi guys, I'm just uh, I'm going back to that uh, object that we we set out to find in the very first place. Oh, the we, uh, the, the tulip nebula. nebula. And I've got the correct filter yeah. in now, so we might stand a chance. Okay, that so sounds I'm like a plan. About thirty seconds away from being on target, I think. Okay. I think I know where it is on the map now. And uh, with the width, the size of the field of view of this thing, I should be, shouldn't have any trouble tripping over it, really. No, it's, uh, it's quite a, a large object. Right. Give it and this is, now, this give is, it an exposure and see what we've got. Uh, we we said uh, this was in the constellation of Cygnus, the Swan, and that's one of the few constellations that looks like what it's meant to be. Some of, some of the constellations, you look at the stars and you wonder how they manage to uh, come up with the object that they meant to be. But the Cyg uh, Cygnus is a huge cross in the northern sky with its uh, which looks like a, a swan with its outspread wings so these two objects that we've i think this uh, is supposed to be it brian right just here right yes you have i can see it well done yeah. and i can see the the star the other star that we needed to see Blended. Right. Oh, that was a, that was just a quick shot. Do you carry on talking? I'm going to run a longer exposure. Okay then. But right. As I mentioned before, that there's a lot of gas and dust uh, in the uh, Cygnus area, and uh, f where stars uh, come close to this gas and dust, they illuminate it, and we're looking about six thousand light years away. And we can see that there are two stars near the, uh, near the nebula. There's the brighter one, and then there's a fainter one. Now, it's that faint one that is lighting up the tulip nebula. And it's a, a, a monster star. It's over 100 times more massive than the sun. It's a a very hot blue giant star uh, and it, what it does it's uh, the ultraviolet radiation from this star this young star is exciting the gas and making it glow and that's what we're seeing now this whole area here we come we can see it now yeah, that's a minute exposure. The other one was 15 seconds. Yeah, we can see now uh, that there's, a, a, on the left-hand side, there's a very abrupt edge. That's where the, the, the stalk of the tulip is, if you like, and the tulip is on its side. So the, the petals are facing towards the right. And we can see the uh, bright blue star that's illuminating this this patch. And it, it's about 70 light years across. Now, if you take your cursor uh, to the that one and then go up one, up to the next star, that one, there is another hot blue star, about the same distance. This one is not so big as the one that's lighting up the nebula. This is only about 40 times the mass of the sun. But it has a companion, a black hole. And this is uh, known as Cygnus X1. It was discovered way back in 1964 when a couple of sounding rockets were sent up 
with Geiger counters on board uh, from New Mexico, and they picked up eight X-ray sources. And this was the, one of the brightest sources they saw in the sky. Uh, of course, the Geiger counters couldn't tell you which star the, the X-ray emissions were coming from. That uh, we had to narrow it down as the instruments got better. But they, the black hole orbits this star very close, so there's no way we're going to see the black hole. Well, it's so a black hole you. You can't see full stop and it's so close it would be lost in the glare of this massive young star and they orbit each other every five and a half days uh, but they're so close material is being drawn off this uh, blue supergiant and uh, is spiraling down onto the accretion disk the material that spirals round the black hole and eventually feeds the black hole. But the black hole is uh, the remains of a massive star that has uh, died. As I said earlier, a star up to eight solar masses dies a gentle death, puffs off its outer layers, makes a, a beautiful planetary nebula, but stars over eight solar masses can blow up in a uh, violent supernova explosion. And uh, really massive stars, the, sm the smaller stars end up as uh, uh, sort of uh, neutron stars, but really massive stars will end, their, their remains will be a black hole. And this is a, a 15 mass solar black hole orbiting around this star. You'll just have to use your imagination uh, of this going round. So that's our uh, one of our nearer black holes. The closest one is about a, a thousand light years away. So there's no danger. You're not going to start uh, digging a, a bunker or anything. You, you, we're well away from all black holes. Right. Well, I that's think... about a two and a half minutes exposure you've got there now. Yeah, we could see that uh, the we could see the the tulip nebula on the left. No wonder it was never never discovered uh, visually. It was just discovered by somebody searching photographs. Right. I think we're near that near the end of our time, and we're just going to go back to. David, and see if you've... Uh, is it still updating? Um, <coughs> where are we? Hang on. Let me talk to you. Yeah, we could. I've got the target star. I can't find you. <laughs> Don't worry. There we go. Don't be under any pressure. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Paul is still sharing. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Um, this is, this is a maybe. Um, I think this is our target star. Right. Um, I seem to have something of a tracking problem. Right, so you can't the stars, go... The stars are shifting across the screen. If I look at my guider, it's struggling. So something's, oh, right. something's gone amiss. Don't worry. Um, so I'm... Well, I'm well, we can, I'll, I'll just... Well, we, we're coming to the, the end of it. If you can just point to the star, uh, we could always come back to it next week. Okay. That is uh, a faint star. It's called A.E. Arigi. And Ariga is the charioteer. And this is another blue giant star. On a good conditions, it, it's just visible to the naked eye. But it is a runaway star. It was part of a binary system. And uh, this uh, catastrophe happened to it about two million years ago. 
it was a binary star and it encountered another binary system. And the two star, star systems came together and the orbits were totally disrupted. All four stars were blue giants. And from the encounter, one star from each pair formed a new binary star. And the remaining two stars were flung out of the system at high speed uh, in opposite directions. Uh, the, 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 uh, ca the, uh, the catastrophe happened very near to the Orion Nebula. And the star we're looking at now came northwards towards Auriga. And the other star went southwards towards Columba which is the constellation of the Dove, well below the constellation of Orion. And this star is really motoring. It, the separation speed is three quarters of a million kilometres an hour, which means it's, it's whizzing along at a fair old rate. But we can't show you what it's doing. It's doing exactly the same as in the uh, Tulip Nebula, it's shining on the uh, some gas and uh, exciting it and making it glow. But because Paul uh, David's got uh, guiding problems, we can't do a very deep exposure to show you the, the flaming star nebula. So we'll probably come back to that uh, uh, in another time. And we're now, we've overrun slightly, but... Uh, say thank you very much to all our uh, telescope uh, operators. That's uh, uh, Mick in uh, Swaffenpra, David in Halton, and Paul in Over. And uh, we'll hand you back, and thanks for watching. Hand you back to Matt. Wonderful, thanks, Brian. And yeah, just like to echo thanks to all our observers. Uh, as always, as well as thanks to James, our headline speaker, who gave us that fascinating talk. Um, so that is it. Hope you all enjoyed it uh, at home. Um, we're going to be doing an, another one of these next week and another one, another one of these evenings every single Wednesday, um, all the way through to the end of March with a couple of weeks off for Christmas. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to have a returning speaker, uh, Dr. Nina Sartorio, who's going to tell us all about x-rays and the bare bones of the universe. So that same time next week. Um, see you then.